please welcome Senator Bill Cassidy and President and CEO of American Forests, Jad Daly. Senator Cassidy, welcome. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for your leadership on climate change and energy security issues. And look, we know these issues are a front of mind for you as a member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and as someone hailing from a state uh, that on one hand has more than 12% of its jobs uh, linked to the oil and gas industry, and at the same time is also facing some of the most uh, intense impacts uh, from climate change already and has globally leading resilience efforts underway. So we're really excited to lean into your uh, legacy of bipartisan leadership. Anyone just go to your website, you can see you seem to work just about everyone in the US Senate. And so I want to dig into today, how do we get that kind of bipartisan leadership fully ramped up on the climate crisis? And so I want to start with the infrastructure bill, because I think that's a real example of success. And you were a big leader uh, in developing that infrastructure bill. It has all sorts of critical investments to slow climate change and build resilience. And that includes $47 billion uh, for addressing the kind of, uh, for example, coastal resilience challenges that you're facing in Louisiana. So, and you called that one of the most significant investments in coastal resilience and infrastructure in Louisiana history. So if you could talk a, a little bit more about what's in that infrastructure bill that excites you, what are we going to be, able, going to be able to do now that we haven't been able to do before uh, to address uh, climate change and, and climate change resilience? Thank you, Jed. Thanks for having me. There's many things about that bill that I like, but let me start with this. To set context, there is a nexus between uh, energy, climate, the economy of a country and the economy of a family and national security if you're talking about a national security stage. But Louisiana is such a kind of, my gosh, demonstration of the first three. You mentioned the importance of the uh, energy-related industries to the employment in my state. It's also important to this. As we look around at the plastics, at the chemicals, at everything that has made this room possible, quite likely they were produced in my state. It powers a modern economy. Uh, that's the energy. On the climate, my state has lost enough land to equal the land mass of Delaware. We're on both sides of this. We are suffering from relative sea level rise more than any other state in the nation. So what I like about the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, builds resiliency with billions of how do we f uh, mitigate flooding and restore coastline. Uh, so, climate. It also helps find a lower carbon intensive way to produce energy, uh, whether fuel or uh, electrons. Um, and it might be through um, advanced nuclear, or it might be decarbonizing the production of fuel. But it's energy, if you will. And it's good for the economy, because as a politician, I know that you cannot ignore the economy of a family and maintain political support. So folks' job skills, which they already have, can be employed in creating this lower carbon future. The bipartisan infrastructure bill hits that nexus that's critical. Uh, that's really helpful and just so encouraging, Senator. I think there are a couple things there to, to tug on. You know, sometimes folks have looked at climate change and the imperative to act on climate change as a barrier to economic progress. And I think what you just described is it's an economic opportunity uh, if we leverage it can it. be it can be it can be if we leverage it in the right way um, and I think we know that 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 fear of, uh, of e economic limitations is just one of the things that has driven a substantial uh, a gap, a partisan gap in how people are thinking about climate change at this moment in time and so the question is if you could change one thing about the way that we're talking to each other about climate change right now, the way that folks are working together uh, in the U.S. Senate on climate change right now, what, what can unlock a new bipartisanship on this climate crisis that's affecting all of us equally? Yeah, if, if I could change one thing, it would be to expand our understanding of the issue. Let me go back to that nexus I spoke of. In the late 1980s, Paul Kennedy, I think a Harvard professor, wrote a book, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers about how there is a nexus between energy, between a gro economic growth, and military strength. And I think if Paul Kennedy wrote that book today, he would throw in emissions as well. Now, let me explain that. 
in the mid 2000s the u s and the e u begin to control carbon emissions now there's a cost to doing that but we entered into that and sense of dramatically lowered emissions china at that time chose not to there's a rationale it cost to control emissions so china by ignoring emissions lower the cost of production in their country which created an incentive for companies to move there real life example i spoke to the cfo of a company who said that his company could have either set up in a new manufacturing site in the united states or they could go to china in china they were told they would not have to put on their socks and knock scrubbers that increased their return on investment between 18 and 19 percent if they built here, the return on investment would be 8 to 9 percent. He said, I could not defend on an investor call. Why would we accept such a lower return on investment? A clear example of how ignoring environmental standards created an incentive for economic growth. Now, now in the, since, the e, since the EU and the U.S. in the mid-2000s put in our regulations, we have significantly lowered our emissions. But China's increase in emissions are more than the decrease of those two entities put together. And they've gone from 19th or 20th in the world in manufacturing to first. Their economic strength has increased. Uh, by the way, so has their military strength. Um, and they've used it as an economic driver. We got to flip this. Because right now, if you're Vietnam, you don't say, oh my gosh, let me adopt EU and US standards. They're going to say, let us adopt Chinese standards because we're competing with China for economic growth. We've got to flip it so that countries are incented to lower emissions, not to ignore emissions. Now, by the way, Jad, I've been advocating a carbon border adjustment. If the EU and the US on certain selected high uh, carbon intensity products demand certain standards, and there is a country overseas which is not meeting those standards, then they import their product to us, there would be a carbon border adjustment. That flips it. Now, instead of incenting no standards whatsoever, you are incenting, well, we don't want to pay that fee, so let us invest in standards so that when we ship to the EU and the US, we'll be able to enter with minimal penalty. If we do that, we can create a race to the top as opposed to chasing to the bottom. That's great. We have to think about this as a global issue, right? Oh, yes. Countries oh, can't, oh, I, let yeah. me finish. I was, got so involved. G go back to that nexus. How do I get bipartisan consensus? If you look at the nexus of national security, climate, energy, and the economy, if that is the understanding, with what I just described on a carbon border adjustment, you can go to the climate hawk and get her buy-in. You can go to the national security hawk and get his buy-in. You can go to the trade union or the economists, but all see a policy here that meets a primary goal they have. That's how you get bipartisan agreement, by creating an understanding which all understand to be of importance to that which they hold most important. Well, Senator, we're in our last couple of minutes. I want to throw you a couple of softballs uh, on the bipartisanship uh, that we're looking for. Um, the first one is natural climate solutions. We already talked a little bit about this, the investment in coastal resiliency, uh, for example, um, as part of our shared interest in climate change. But how about using forests and wetlands and other natural systems to naturally uh, capture carbon dioxide? Can we ramp that up together? Is that, is that a bipartisan uh, b bridge to bipartisan action? It certainly can be negative carbon offsets. You've got to document how much on net they actually resolve. I would love to rebuild some coastline in Louisiana. All you folks interested in financing, you got my card, give me a call. Um, because that would be fantastic, both to create resiliency, but also to be a negative sink. But it's my understanding that there's a certain emission of methane, there's a certain subtraction of carbon, and it's that net value which is difficult. We were talking backstage about trees, a great carbon sink. So the degree that we can invest in that and then hold the sink accountable for truly lowering carbon, I think that's a great idea. Super, yeah, actually, and Louisiana has some of the most carbon-hungry forests in the world, as a matter of fact. Well, okay, here's the last one. So you've talked about Operation Warp Speed, about the need to uh, be in, become more strategic and, and efficient in the way that we ramp up energy production. And the question is, can we find bipartisanship around having that be equally around meeting our needs for traditional energy sources 
and renewable energy sources? Can we have Operation Warp Speed on both sides of that equation? So by Operation Warp Speed, I mean trying to align uh, the bureaucracies so that they actually are working together, not at cross purposes. This is important to the renewable. This is important to the traditional. In the Senate, I think we can pull that off. Frankly, I don't know if the administration is there yet. I think this kind of mm, lack of progress suits the purpose of some, and I regret to say that. Well, we're going to have to leave it there to end on time, but maybe that's a great starting point uh, for a new bipartisan effort uh, to get warp speed on uh, traditional energy needs, renewable energy needs, and energy efficiency, so we actually need less energy in the first place. Good. Thanks so much. Thank you.